All right, guys, good morning. We're going to get started. Welcome. If you're visiting today, welcome. Glad you're here. And hello to everyone tuning in online. We're glad you could join us as well today. Um, as you can see behind me, this is not Aaron. <laughs> we have a guest worship leader today. Jonathan will be leading us in worship in a moment. Um, Aaron and Tracy are in Georgia right now. Aaron was asked to officiate a wedding, so they traveled back east to be a part of that this week. Um, so I'm going to pray for Jonathan and for our service, and then we'll get started. Lord, thank you so much for this morning and just that you're here with us. We thank you for your presence, God. We thank you for bringing John here today to worship with us and just to lead us into your presence, Lord. And thank you that you meet us in a place of hunger. So, Lord, we just hunger after you. We hunger after your presence. We thank you for your love, and we pray that your, your love would just fill this place, God, and that we would honor you with our words and with our worship, God. We love you so much, and we just give this morning to you, Jesus.
Hi, 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 it's me, Daniel, and I'm back with some announcements. Well, of course. Why else would I be here? Welcome to CityGate. Let's dive right in. Now, our monthly women's meeting is coming up in a couple of weeks on Friday, April 23rd at 7 p.m. Our ladies will be meeting at Brenda Ziek's home and Pilar Franson will be speaking. Now, the Cox Home Group, well, that's me, us, our, We'll have a potluck this week, Tuesday, April 13th at 6 p.m. All are welcome to join the barbecue, baby back ribs. And no, I'm not trying to bribe you, but yeah. Please contact Cecile or me if you'd like to participate. We'd love to see you. Info's online in the events section of our website. And speaking of our website and all things online, if you haven't yet, be sure to navigate to CityGate OC Facebook, uh, the page, and give us a follow. This will ensure that you get any updates and info 
via Facebook. Now you can also sign up for the newsletter at citygateoc.com as well if that's what you'd like to do to stay up to date and you're not on Facebook. Finally, mark your calendars for Friday, May 7th at 7 p.m. for our family worship night. Location to be determined. At least we have a date. Oh, I accidentally lied to you there. Finally, and this one's especially important, if you're giving me a check, please, 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 make sure you make your checks out to CityGate OC and not to Vineyard at the River. That's CityGate OC because, well, we're CityGate OC. Thanks, everyone. Now back to you, Chief. Yikes, guys, sorry. Uh, remember how I said, finally, and then told you an announcement only to shortly thereafter tell you that I lied and gave a real finally? Well, I see now that I've made a big mistake. And I actually have one more announcement. Like, if you order City Gate Birds, we apologize for the delay in its arrival. The majority of items are ordered and scheduled to arrive this week, so we'll be giving them out to you next Sunday. But don't quote me, I might be lying. I don't know. I, I see how I've been acting, and honestly, guys, this just isn't me. I, I see now that I can't just say, finally, all willy-nilly, you know, when I don't really really mean yeah. I promise I'll do better. Okay, I'm finally done with the announcements. I love you. Appreciate you so much. I'm out. Finally. sitting with his girlfriend, I forgot your name, Darcy, Darcy. and uh, I asked Darcy, I said, so why did you pick him? She goes, well, look at him. <laughs> I said, okay, enough said. Good to have you guys. And Darcy's parents, good to meet you guys. Good to have you here. Jonathan, you were just amazing, and, and I was blessed by you leading worship this morning. So good morning. Good morning. City gate, huh? Kind of fun to say that for me. Um, God is doing some really fun things in our midst. Um, just right up front, just to let you know, um, I'm not going to put it at the end of the sermon. Uh, we are looking still for a building. Um, there's one that I found this week that I went and looked at. And um, I need you to pray. Because there are also four developers that have looked at the site, which means what they will do is tear the building down and then build things, other things, right? And so um, we're going to go in and talk to the people and, and visit the building on Wednesday. And, and uh, I just want you to pray for God's favor. If this is where he would have us move, um, I will tell you it's a, it's a 12,000 square foot building, which is bigger than what we need. Um, there are over a hundred parking spaces in the parking lot, um, but our vision, which is what I'm talking about today, is, uh, is really, um, I think, needing a place like that. Anything too small, we're going to outgrow real quickly. Uh, anything too small, we really can't serve the community in the way that we want to serve the community. And so be praying, and I hope that God will... If this is it, I know that God will give it to us. If not, then he will show us another place, okay? All right. So we're talking about our vision this morning. What is CityGate all about? And 
As you've been listening to me for the last couple of years, um, I kind of always push the vision out to you. And, it, and sometimes you don't really, it's not, it's not described as vision, but it's really described as, as who we are called to be. As believers in Christ, who we're called to be. Am I still too loud or are you guys good? Still too loud? Turn me down just a little bit more. Is this a little bit better? Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Hey, this, this is what they do on set, okay? So we are a, a movement for anybody. We don't call ourselves a church. I mean, we are a church, but I would rather use the word movement. Um, we talked about it when, when Jesus establishes really the whole idea of church. He says, you are the ecclesia, and upon this rock, or you are... Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia, my movement. Upon what you've said, Peter, I am going to establish a movement, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Yeah. And then around 303 uh, AD, um, some people got the idea of changing the word ecclesia um, to kirche, and kirche meaning church or location. It's basically uh, um, the location, the place um, where God resides. And ever since then, the church has kind of become this place that you go to. And, um, and there's good things about that. But there's a lot of bad things because Jesus didn't say, I'm going to build you a building. Yeah, uh, he didn't say that I'm going to establish a group of people. He said, I'm going to establish a movement. And so I think the church has kind of gotten a, uh, an idea over, the, over time that um, what you do is you go and you, on a Sunday and you sing. And like we just did, and then you listen to a talking head like you're doing now, and, and then hopefully it's good, and then you leave, and then the next week you come back. But really, that isn't what Jesus wanted to establish. And so this morning, I want to kind of look at the first church in Acts 2. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, turn to Acts 2. And I just want to say, you know, if you're alive and not living under a rock, you know that we're going through difficult times now in society. There's a lot of stuff going on, stuff that I have never witnessed in my lifetime. Divisions that are going on, political divisions, um, uh, racial divisions going on in a way that um, it seems like the world is just tearing everybody apart. And, and I believe that it's an opportunity now for the church to stand up and be who God called them to be, and that is to bring people together in Christ. There are no divisions in the church. Now, I say that, and everybody goes, yes, that's true, but we have the same problem in society as they had actually in the first church. I've heard people actually say, if you are a Democrat, you can't become a Christian. If you are a Republican, you are racist. Really, it's like, my goodness, really. Can I tell you that in the kingdom, there's no Democrat and there's no Republican? And, and it should not be in the building. If you sent me anything political, which someone did, they got very hurt when I told them, I do not do politics. And I won't do it here. If you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, welcome. Because we are in a really special family. And that means all of us are, are different. And we actually may believe different things. That's okay. And so what I want to talk about today is the first church, and in particular, what it is to have relationship together. That God has called us as a family into relationship. So it's important to recognize as we look at this passage in Acts that they were going through a lot of the same things that we're going through today. They had major racial divides between the Jews, the Gentiles, the Samaritans, the Romans. Major divides going on. And then you also have a political divide where Rome has come in and occupied Jerusalem. This was a very difficult time for the church. 
And yet it was in this context that the church is birthed and grows. Excuse me. So let's look at it here. Acts 2, 42. Beginning at, chapter, or at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, as many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It's important, I think, as we look at this, that we understand, and we look at the idea of relationship, that we understand how God actually created us to be. And so in order to do that, we, we, we need to go back to Genesis, the first chapter, and you'll see that, that God is now creating all things. And, and at, at one point, he gets, and he, and, he, and he says this, he says, and we shall make man in our image. You remember that? And, and so we got this, this, God makes this statement that really gives us the idea of a trinity, or the trinity. We will make man in our image. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were in perfect relationship with each other. And then at one point he says, when he says we will make man, it's literally this pouring out of his love relationship with himself. It pours out and he says, let's make man, somebody that looks like us. And so he makes man, and then he says this, he goes, ah, that's not very good. I better make a woman too. Men, we need women. Because by ourselves, Jonathan, by yourself, no, we need women. It's not good. Why? Because it's not good for us to be alone. See, God made us to be in relationship. That's how he made us, to be in relationship. Just in the same way that he is in relationship, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are in relationship, he says, I'm making man in our image, and the only way that I can do that is to have them in relationship. That's what image is God. Do you see that? Have you ever heard, uh, been to a wedding? Some of you probably have. When, when it says, and the two shall become what? One flesh. Okay? That's the image of God. It's when, when we are joined together, it's like now I look more like him. That's why it wasn't good for man to be by himself. He was made for relationship with others. He created us for community. And regardless of what you believe about God, regardless of what you think about God, everyone acts this out. Everyone does. I mean, take time to, to look around. Everybody kind of gets into groups, don't they? And, and, and you know, I remember in high school, all the different groups of students, you'd find somebody that's kind of like you and you'd group yourself with them. And, and, and the reason you did that was because you were an individual, you didn't want to be like everybody else, right? I mean, even people who are anti-community, groups that, that are against established community, they establish community together. I mean, it happened in Seattle this summer. Did you notice that? I'm, a, I'm against the establishment. And so they build this little town, and they build this community, and they establish this community together. And it becomes everything that outside of them is. We all want relationship and community. That's how we're made. And so let's take a closer look. Let's start look at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. In these four things, teaching, fellowship, eating, and praying, you'll see two things emphasized. Four things emphasizing two things. One, they are devoted to God. The church, early church, 
was devoted to God. Okay? They prayed together and they came and listened to the apostles teach. The other thing, they are devoted to each other in fellowship. You see that in the breaking of bread together. In fellowship together. So at the most basic level, this is what church is. It's gospel central, centrality and it is uh, our gospel centrality and gospel community. Thank you, I can get that out. Now, it has to be both if we're going to be the church that God intends us to be. Gospel centrality, there are a lot of churches that teach the Bible. I've been to them. They are amazing. But they do life together very poorly, and they really don't hold that up as something that's important. And, and really what that is, it's, it's, it's seminary. So a lot of churches are like seminary. You have an amazing Bible teacher who will get up and he will teach you the Bible. And I love that. But if you don't have that fellowship, that community element, you're not the church that God intends you to be. And then there are a lot of people that have that fellowship part nailed down. They are a community and they love each other and they spend all kinds of time with each other and they do all kinds of things in their services, but they don't really teach the word. And God doesn't want that either. The church, that's not what the church is about. We've got to have both of those things. And this is, this is what Luke is saying in Acts. He says these four things will show us that we have to have a, a gospel a centrality and gospel community. We've got to have both of those elements. So, this is what happened to the early church. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves to listening to the Bible being taught. Now, I just have to tell you, it isn't just listening, it's applying. Coming and hearing a word without applying it to your life is, the Bible says, it's like going to a mirror and going away and forgetting what for myself. Or I think I kind of have it together. I kind of have it nailed down. I'm actually pretty comfortable with where I'm at with God. And, and we get into this place where we can kind of, we can put things into certain categories and I have certain um, words and phrases that I can use. And, and I really kind of, begin to look at other people more than I look at myself. I think we, we, we tend to, to say, oh, you know, that person, Republican, this is who they are. I, I, I'm Democrat and, and, you know, they just don't know. Or vice versa. We begin to actually look and judge other people and, and stop looking at our hearts. People that don't know God, we, we're really good at identifying things in their life that they need to change. What I want us to do as a church is be really good at identifying things in our lives that need to change. When I do marriage counseling, it's crazy how well the husband knows the wife and the wife knows the husband, but they don't know themselves very well. As a matter of fact, what the husband knows about the wife, the wife will say, that's not true. And what the, the wife knows about the husband, the husband will say, that's not even close to being true. But what they center on is the other. So I want to be a church where when we come, whatever we talk about, you look at you. You stay on your side of the tracks. And you go, God, what about this is for me? And that you're honest and you're open. Christians sometimes can be the most closed people because we're supposed to have it together, aren't we? You know, we, we, it's like, ugh, if I'm a Christian, I've got to have my life together. And so we live this Facebook life in front of people. And I see it all the time. And it's like, why can't we just get honest and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with something. And, and rather than have people go, oh, have people go, yeah, I kind of know. Uh, that is. I remember one time in one of our, my small group, we were talking and, and uh, coming to the end of the group. And uh, as we're just getting ready to wrap up, one of the husbands says, 
I guess I should say something. Okay. And he began to talk about an area of his life where he was struggling. And I was so excited because that's what relationship is. It's, it's being able to just, okay, I want you to see me. I want you to know me. And I want to have relationship with you. It was really an amazing time. The second thing, they, they devoted themselves together uh, in getting together in fellowship. True, honest, sincere, intimate relationship. Three, they devoted themselves to eating meals together. You can see I'm good at this one. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> meals. I like meals. One of the things we want to do as a church, I am just so excited about, is when we have our own building, on Sunday mornings, we will have pancake breakfast for the whole community. Just come have some breakfast with us. We just want to meet you, say hi. And I'll be one of those guys out there flipping the pancakes. I love this kind of stuff. You see, notice the greatest times in history are when people eat together. It's also one of the most intimate times, is eating together. I remember a friend of mine, his name was Doug. I met him in Oregon, and he was dying. And he was telling me, Don, I'm, I'm probably not going to get to talk to you again. Um, I will be dead probably by the weekend. He was writing this. He says, I just want you to know that you are one of those men in my life that could always come and put your feet under my table. That was intimate. That's that place where I trust you. I love you. Um, I would, I would be with you and we could have this, this, this life together that's honest and true and open. Devoting themselves to eating meals. Devoting to prayer for each other. Who do you have in your life right now that you can have pray for you? I was going through something, you all remember, I talked about it a couple months ago. Uh, I was very discouraged. And I have five guys in my life, there are more, but I've identified five guys in my life all over the United States that will pray for me. I know they will because they love me. And so I contacted all five and I said, guys, I need you now. Will you please pray for me? And each one prayed and encouraged me. Who do you have in your life that you can share really honestly with? You can share anything with? It's so important that we pray together. This is what it means, I think, to belong to our church, to City Gate. It's not just going once a week and then going home. It's being devoted to each other. At a very basic level, this is the first thing I want us to really take seriously as we move through this year. Look at your relationships in this church. What are they like? Get to know somebody. I was talking with Jonathan, and he has a mentor. I said, how did that happen? And he said, well, I just saw this, this person, and I, I loved them. I, I, I just I admired them. And so I just went up and said, hey, can we spend some time together? Being devoted to each other is so important. And when this happens, I want you to look at something really cool. When this happens, look at verse 43. And all came upon every soul. All came upon every soul. If the church will live together doing these four things, people from all over the place are going to take notice. Seriously, this is not normal. If you are living honestly and openly and loving each other, no matter what your background, no matter who you are, no matter how much you make or don't make, no matter what your skin color is or isn't, no matter what your political affiliation, you're living together in this way, what happens? Oh, people go, oh my gosh, look at that church. We have a dog that comes into our church every once in a while. Pitbull. You like dogs? Bazooka Joe. And it's amazing. You guys love him. He just walks around and says hi to everybody. Do you know how many people have said to me when they were visiting, they go, I've never seen a church that has dogs. It was, they were in awe. 
awe comes when we live this way. People see it from the outside and they go, okay, that is not normal. <laughs> awe comes on every soul. People take notice and they'll be filled with awe. You see, all of this can happen when Jesus is at the center of everything we do. All of this can happen. As people look at us, they'll be filled with awe. And now I want you to notice the next thing that takes place. And many signs and wonders, or wonders and signs, were being done through the apostles. Now I want you to see the order here. The awe wasn't because of the signs and wonders being done. The awe was because of the relationships that were established. And when you have that kind of unity, what can happen? Many signs and wonders can take place. Why? Because we're living together in love and unity. As the Father intended, He, unity with Himself, perfect unity with Himself. Jesus says, I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. There's this unity that's going on, and when that happens, signs and wonders can take place. We're called to be community, living in right relationship with God and with one another. And what happens next? If people from outside our family see us, they witness a people, every tribe, every tongue, every nation living together. City Gate, if we get this right, if we get this right, the people of our community and beyond will be filled with awe. They will be. If we get this loving thing right, this relationship right, if we, if we stop looking at the things we don't agree with and start looking at the things we do. You know, people are complicated. They really are. And, and the more that I get to know people and I listen to their story, the more I understand how they come to the place that they're at. It, it may not be the place where they, where they will always be. As a matter of fact, it won't be. But what happens sometimes is we get to meet somebody or we see somebody and we, we automatic, it, it automatically, we kind of see something we don't like or we hear something we don't like and we kind of back away. There's more to people sometimes than what's presented at first. And we're called to get to know each other in fellowship together. Look, the, the nation is in a place where it's being torn apart. People are pointing fingers and it's crazy to me. I, I'm getting to a place where I don't even want to turn on the TV. Because all you hear is negative. One channel says this, this channel says something completely opposite. The two channels are always biting and bickering and mad at each other. See, the church is the only place that really has the answer. Really, it's the only place. Look at verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their positions, possessions and belongings, distributing proceeds to all as they had need. They shared everything together. Now, I want you to understand, this is not socialism. This is called generosity. There's a huge difference between socialism and generosity. Socialism is being generous with somebody else's money. Generosity is being compelled to give because, what you've been, because of what you've been given by Jesus himself. We see that Jesus gave everything he had. And so why would we be any different than that? If we love the way he loves, why would we be any different than just being compelled to give to people in need? They had all things in common. They sold everything. Verse 46. And the angels? Verse 46. And the day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread together in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Two things. They were meeting in the temple, as we are now. And they were meeting in small groups. Both of them. They were meeting in the temple, 
but they also were committed to each other in smaller groups, getting to know each other more and more intimately. So many people that I talk to now are just going, I don't go to church anymore. I just have a small group at my house. I go, that's really good, but you're missing out. You see, you're missing out on what the larger group can bring you, and worse than that is, the larger group is missing out on what you bring. And you can take that down to a small group level. If you're not involved in a small group, which we are going to center on this year, by the way, if you're not involved in a small group, then you're missing out on what God wants to do in your life by being in tight relationship with people, and worse, they're missing out on you and what you bring to the whole equation. We need you, and you need us. If you will risk this kind of relationship this year, you may find yourself walking around with a glad and generous, generous heart. Verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all people. Now, for me, this is where it starts to get really exciting. And so I'm going to try and keep myself calm and deliver this with a calm voice. It says, okay, you would think that a church devoted to God and devoted to one another, you would think that it would lead to a group of people becoming ingrown. That it, all of a sudden it's like this tight group that nobody can fit in. Right? That's what you would think. But look what happens. Two things, verse 47. Having favor with all people. People from the outside start to look in, and we have favor with them. I am praying for favor for a building. I want to have favor with the city. I want the city to see us and go, whatever they want, they're good for our community. We will have favor with people. When we're devoted to God and we're devoted to keep relationships with each other together, people will take notice. And then this is what happens. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Is that not exciting? We have what people want. We have to live it and demonstrate it. Not in a way that's prideful, but as people see, my goodness, look at that. They have people of every color. And I know that person doesn't like that kind of person. And yet, look at them, they're together, and they're all wearing green stickers. I'm telling you, every single person alive was created for community. Every single person. When they see us living out this kind of community, it's something that they will deeply desire. You will be attractive. People will take notice. And then, when they come, whether they are a homeless person who smells to high heaven and sits down next to you, I want them to experience love. Whether they're a bazillionaire that walks in and sits down, and you can tell this guy's got a lot, I want them to feel loved. They're looking, all of us, no matter where we are in life, are looking for that place to have community. And we as a church, we as believers, we have what people are looking for. We're living in a time where there's tremendous division. A time that, that seems to be getting darker and darker by the day. But they say that a light shines brightest in the darkest times. With all the, the racial and political disunity that's going on today, what better time is there than today for the church to stand up and be who God intended it to be? This is really hard to do because it will mean you have to be seen by someone for what and who you really are. It will mean you have to put down all of this stuff that keeps you safe, 
which is what we normally see in people, by the way. When we disagree with somebody, it's like, take a look at them and go, okay, this is how they have to be, whatever they've gone through, this is who they are, and, and, and it's kept them safe up to this point. I love that about them. When I was a therapist, that was the one thing I loved most about people that came in. It's like, oh my goodness, you have all these defense mechanisms. Good for you. You've, been, you've, you've kept yourself safe up to this point. Now you're in a place where you can be safe and you can be healed. Where you don't have to hold all of those defense mechanisms back. What better time is there than today for the church to stand up? Not to stand up and tell everybody what they're doing wrong, but to concentrate on the, not to concentrate on the things that you might disagree with, but that you would be united in Christ. Let's start there. Let's let everything else go. Hey, now, what's going through your head? Well, what about this? Let it go. Well, how about this? God says this, let it go. Why do I say that? Because my job, and, and you guys may disagree with me, and that's okay. You're wrong. <laughs> my job, God says, is to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's my job. And then there's a second part, and love your neighbor. Yes. Amen. Done. Amen. Done. He doesn't say, love your neighbor, but... Correct them if you disagree. Love your neighbor. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's job... Well, here I go. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's his job. Now, how can he do that? What provides the environment for the Holy Spirit to begin to move in that way? Unity and love. Love. And unity. Do you want to see all kinds of signs and wonders that love each other? Let's be unified together. And the Holy Spirit then has this atmosphere in which he can do whatever he wants to do because people are open to it. Does that make sense? So, that's who we are, City Gate. There's much more that I have, and I'll get to it sometime. <laughs> but that's really, in essence, what we're about. And I believe that you are on the verge of seeing, if we do this, you are on the verge of seeing a community change. You are on the verge of seeing people come to know Jesus that would have never stepped foot in a church because the last time they did, it didn't look like anything they wanted to be part of. If we do this, people will step into this church and go, Never been to a church like this before. They had a dog running around, pit bull. Okay. They had two dogs that week, as a matter of fact. Guys, let's just, let's just allow people to come. And let's just love them. Please, you don't have to save them. The Holy Spirit will work on them as you do that. And then love each other. Get into a small group this year. I want you to get to know each other. I know some of you, and some of you are really cool. Okay? So you may get the jackpot. Or you'll meet the others. <laughs> then you get to love them. Okay? We're going to be talking uh, in the coming weeks. I'm going to wrap up with this. We're actually going to be talking about who is my neighbor. That's going to be the the series that we're going to be covering. And it really, it goes a little deeper into what this looks like, what we've been talking about looks like. So I would encourage you to come back um, next week as we kind of kick off that series. Those of you that are online, uh, I'm so glad you're here. I would encourage you to come back next week. Uh, I think it's going to be a really wonderful series. I'm looking forward to giving it. And, uh, yeah. Amen? Amen. All right, now, I'm going to impress everybody, especially Caitlin, because <laughs> I remember to do something. It says here, closing the service in pink, and I need to read all of this for you, okay? Everyone tuning in, tuning in online, 
glad you're here. We want you to come back again at 9 o'clock next week. If you're watching and, and you want to support the church, um, unfortunately, we have to, we have to pay bills. Um, and you want to give something, just, um, oh, i got to read it. Give online at our website, or you can mail a check to uh, the church's P.O. Box, and all that information can be found at citygateoc.com, citygateoc.com. Um, and if you can, start writing your checks out to Citygate OC. For all of you here in person, and if you would like to give, there's a white box back there. One of the things I'm hoping we never have to do again, okay, I'm saying this and the board doesn't know, I hate passing plates. Okay, I just hate passing plates. And with COVID, it's like, yes, it's a gift. I don't have to pass a plate. But there's a white box back there. Um, you can put uh, your gift in there. Um, uh, I don't ever see it. I don't look at money, and I don't know who gives or doesn't give. So don't try to impress me because you won't, because I won't know. Okay? So if you give, um, there are only few eyes that will see that. Uh, uh, give a little drop in the box. Also, before you leave today, we have 10 extra hope baggies that were put together last Sunday, but still need to be delivered. Two of them are for widows, and eight are for kids. If you don't know what those are, we did a little bit of an outreach, just kind of a teaser for you guys. And so we put together bags just to say, let people know we love you. We see you. And so we have a few of those left. We have eight that are for kids. If you know a kid that could just use a little encouragement, um, take one of those. Or if you know a widow that just sometimes feels alone and is nearby, take her one and just tell her we, we love her. Okay? So you can pick that up today, right in somebody's day. Exit the sanctuary doors by that way, the pond, and grab some coffee outside. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> We hope to see you next Sunday, exclamation point. Amen? Amen. 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 I love you guys. Have a great week, all right?